Welcome everybody to today's Midnight 6.6 .6 training video. Today we'll be covering report customization on a more advanced level. This is part two to the two-part report training series that we'll be going over through Midnight's training on reports. And this one will be focusing more on the actual customization and definition of report customization objects that you'll see in the report designer. We will not be going over features such as how to create backups, how to safely restore those backups, how to rename reports and such. We'll simply be looking at the designer for with which how to change up how the reports look and in some cases how they function. We'll also be looking at some core elements as far as how the reports can be customized and tied to each other by using either subreports or reports within reports. And taking a very brief look at how to make a couple of changes regarding search filters, options, return data, and exporting formatting. If you're familiar with our prior training or you have some experience with SQL development, then you may feel as though this training will be covering topics similar to what you're used to working with. If you don't, and you've still been using our reports editor to some degree, then I'll do my best to help make sure that you have everything understood. And do be aware that if I cover something that is not related to a topic that you're looking for in terms of report customization, you can email us at support at virtual, I'm sorry, support at printreach com, and we'll do our best to help get those modifications either done for you or teach you how to do them yourself. So that way, if you'd like to take advantage of our reporting tools yourself rather than relying on us, you can do so. As far as report customization goes, there is a, or there are a handful of ways that you can get into reports, either through the report module itself or through the various module that you would access your reports from, such as within an estimate or within an order. For today's training, we'll take a look at reports through our reports module. Furthermore, in today's example, we'll take a look at one of our inventory reports for an example for today. In this case, using our inventory transaction detail report. If you remember from our basics training, we do suggest that anytime you create a new report, that you utilize the create report button here to build one from scratch, but you reference the report you'd like to clone the base report from. Otherwise, there won't be any data tied into it. I'll be selecting my inventory transaction detail report from this list under the clone from dropdown, and we'll give it a new name just so that way it stands out. And by giving it a display name here, this is the name of the report that we'll see on this column on the left when we decide to open it in the future. So the report that we've built allows us to see a transaction history or a log of all the transactions that have been made against inventory on our particular site. We have the ability to plug in a date range and also a customer name, so that way if we need to return information to a client showing them their consumption or usage of inventory, we can do so. Within the editor itself, we have access to a variety of features that allow us to customize how this report looks. For the start, you'll notice that we are currently on page one of the report. Certain reports will have multiple pages and you can create new pages or delete existing ones by clicking with your right cursor button here, add new page. Rearrange them by clicking move right and move left. And with your page highlighted, if you wanna get rid of it, right click and hit delete to get rid of it. When creating custom reports, for a starting level, if you're not too familiar with report editing and customization, 
that you create a new page of the report. Format the page dimensions to be the same on both of your pages. In this case, we're referencing a 10.6 by 8.27. And then selecting every key band here by holding control and click to select, right clicking and copying or control C to copy, going to your new page and hitting paste. And then clicking save to have two versions of this report available. Finally, I would turn one of your pages off and you can do so by making sure that you have a blank area of the page selected either by clicking outside of the margins of your report, but inside of the page dimensions, or just by selecting your page here in the select, uh, component selection dropdown and turning your enabled to false. This effectively allows you to keep a backup of your report as you're currently designing it. So that way you can customize different areas of it and still have the original to fall back on, just in case you're not sure how something may have started. And we'll be using page one as the report that we'll be editing and page two as the backup. We can rename our pages by having one of them selected, scrolling down in our properties while our page is selected and then giving our report page a name. And this one I'll call it custom and original. We'll be coming back to this design for a field name later on in the report's design process. So do remember this area as it does serve more than or more purposes than just renaming the page that you're in. From here, we can see that we have a couple of text boxes that show details of our report and that they're within containers. If we click and drag to move them around, we can relocate them on top or on underneath each other to a certain degree. Some you can move around and some you can't, and the reason for this is due to their properties. If you expand your bands list here on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left side, the right side panel that expands out lets you know what your different bands are that you can add to a report. These bands behave in such a way that some can be moved around and others cannot, and that's by design. Some can be set to appear on the top of a page, like a page header or the page footer that this report currently had. Others can be set to appear after data, but before the page footer and vice versa. And then you have your header band and footer band, which are more or less labels that search for data to display a label on top of, and grouping bands, group header and footer bands, which allow you to group the data within a data band in a certain way. In this example, I'm gonna create a group header band and I'm going to group my inventory transactions by item. I've also got a page header and a page footer. And of course my data band here is where the actual data of my report exists. You can only have one data band between group bands because you can't group by two different methods of data. However, you can change how your data is presented within your group. Each band has its own properties and starting from the data band, if you click into the dark blue portion of it, you'll select the data band itself. If you double click into it, a pop-up will appear. And in here you can control a couple of things, the most notable being the sort options that allow you to change, add or remove areas and controls of how the data would be sorted. And the filters that allow you to selectively determine what data will or will not be allowed to appear. 
the sort functionality allows you to pick a new choice by hitting add sort and then rearrange them by selecting what you want to relocate and moving it up and down in tandem with the rest of the sort options that are currently present. So you can sort by a variety of options. In this case, the report's default sorting would sort the inventory by customer name, then by transaction date, and then by time in ascending order for each. In this case, I'm going to remove my customer name sort because I'm grouping by item and inventory in midnight is all driven by the customer. I can also set up filters so that way only certain types of data are pulled in. An example of what this report currently does is that it shows all inventory that has been added as well as subtracted from midnight. I can modify this so that way we can see only transactions or trans type descriptions in the case of this report's data column that are equal to subtract. And we can build up our search filtering even more by adding a layer of filters. In this case, selecting or and setting up another one for inventory transactions of pull. In this case, now we have one that says search for anything that has a transaction type equal to subtract or equal to pull. Now from here, we've done some effective data manipulation. We do have the grouping though that we need to consider. Because we're grouping by item name, you'll likely want to have your item name above each group of inventory transaction details that are listed here. To get that data onto this report, you'll need to look in one of two places. You can either add a text box, either by clicking and adding after one would be selected from this left side panel. And then going into your data column dropdown and selecting your field of choice. Alternatively, you can go to your dictionary, which is listed here up in the properties area. Expand down your data sources and find the field that you'd like to add. Click and then drag it onto the report where you'd like to place it. Noting that in this case, it comes with a label by default that you can place around where you'd like. This is because of the create label checkbox that's added here. This is checked by default and if you would like it not to drag a label in, then you can just click your column with that unchecked and then add your data column onto the report. In this case, now that I've got my item present, I'm going to extend the size a bit to make sure it encompasses the space necessary to show the name of any item that we'd use. And we'll change up some formatting of it. We'll make the text a tiny bit bigger. We'll make it bold. We can change this alignment in the container by centering it. There's plenty that we can do. The header band that's above it includes a label that will appear once for the entire report itself. If you'd like to change this up, then you can put these labels in underneath or in tandem with the item name. This will result in one of two things. You'll either see this list of column headers every single time that an item is generated or you'll see it one time for the entirety of the report. Now to separate this information from the data that appears below it, you may want to add a line to separate everything. Or you may normally try to underline the text by applying an underline to your actual text that's in each text box. You can do a couple of other things to make this a bit easier. You can draw a line by selecting the horizontal line tool and actually adding a line. Customizing it as needed by going into your borders tool or into your properties and changing up either the thickness, the color, 
the style, etc. Alternatively, you can select each text component, in this case all of the text boxes, which span across the width of the grouping container, and apply a border to the bottom of each one. This means that if you relocate the text boxes, then the line is attached to the text box and therefore moved with it. By expanding the borders properties, you can again make the text line thicker, change its color or its style. And to go one step further, if you'd like to, you can click your container that everything is within and simply add a border to the container. This means that the entire container itself, no matter how you resize or rescale it, will maintain the box around each one. And in the case of this example, for each line item, there would be a grid line around it. For this example, I'm going to put our column headers back into the header band that they were found in. Center everything so that way they appear on the bottom of the container as far as far down low as they can go. Resize our grouping header back up. And then look at our grouping bands in their next stage. Each band has different properties that you can apply to them that allow you to change how they behave and how they interact with the data that would be pulled in with it. We already covered sorting and filtering that data bands possess. Something that both data bands and grouping bands possess is a feature that allows you to create a new page. In this example, we can go to the new page after feature for the group footer band. And what this will do is say that for every group header and all lines of data within it, once the group footer is loaded, after that, create a new page that repeats the cycle until all different types of data have been loaded. Doing this will allow me to have a report that splits one page per item. So that way we can see things grouped out rather than stacked on top of each other. You may need this to show all of your information page by page, or you could just have it run uh, straight through. So there are a variety of reasons to do it either or, depending on how you want to save on paper that you're printing, or if you're making a PDF and it doesn't matter, uh, you can tackle it in either way. The header bands don't have quite as much that you can associate them with. And the report title band is the same. If there were a footer band or a report summary band though, you do see a little bit of different behavior there. With these, you can make them so that way whatever is in them will print at the bottom of the page. This could be useful for invoice reports. If you have a grand total for your invoice, load in the summary, which would appear after everything, and you want that to appear as far down as possible, such as down here, you can't move the band physically. However, because of how the data would present itself, you can make it so that way, if there's not too much data to actually display, then this will just bump itself down to the bottom of the page rather than appearing right after all the data. Page headers and page footers do that by default, so you don't need to worry too much about adjusting their features. For this example, I do want the inventory transaction detail to appear at the top of every page though, but the date range, I don't need it to appear on every page, only the first. In this example, then I can just create that modification by moving the title of the report to the top. 
keeping the report title band inclusive with the date that's utilized from the date search. Let the header handle the labels for each column and then group everything accordingly. The footer band in this example is actually unnecessary, but we'll keep it here with a zero height. So that way there's nothing there to show. And for the report summary band, there are a variety of inclusive uh, actions that we can associate it with. In this example, we'll create a little bit of math to make our day a little easier for some operations. In this sample, I'm going to copy my quantity and paste it into the group footer band. And what we're going to do here is create a little bit of math by going into our expression handler and applying a sum command to our quantity so that way it adds all of our transactions together to let us know what our total activity is for a particular item. And in the report summary band, we can do something a little bit different. We can add a column that represents some of the math that's occurring. The different types, if you're unfamiliar with SQL programming, can be found within the dictionary of the report itself. These would be found under the functions. You can simply look through the different mathematical or totaling functions to find the different type of uh, math that you'd like to create. And in this case, I'm going to set it up so that way my count is going to look at the amount of items that are actually included in here or the amount of transactions that are included in here in total. Because we did this, I would like to add a label, but because I had the create label unchecked, I will just add a text box for it. And with all this set, I'm going to click preview and I'll run my report. Oops. You may not be able to do math for that transaction. Let's see. So just regarding that transaction summary for the math on the transaction count, you can see in our report here that we've got a four page report. We have our quantities adjusted so that way we see only subtractions rather than the adds and subtracts. And therefore we can see that in this date range, 810 of this particular number nine window envelope have been consumed. If we go to the next page, we can see that for my house gloss, 11 by 17 covered text, another 810 have been pulled in total. Continuing down, we have our wall mount menus, 205 pulled. And the report summary shows this total transactions line. There is no data because of I did uh, code that in incorrectly, but because the label exists there, then there is something to show. And it is also because of the new page after that's telling a new page to actually appear. If we turn this new page after off, and instead when we preview it, we'll see everything listed in one page. And again, because our header is listed up at the top of the report itself, we only have one series of column headers for everything, which is totally fine. We also have our page footer at the bottom that says page one of one to let us know just you know how big our report is. Now aligning text boxes can be convenient when ad adjusting something within your report. And you may need to change up how your text boxes are lined up or displayed for two reasons. One, how they 
present themselves on a printed product, and two, how they extract into a program like Microsoft Excel. For the case of this example, we'll leave the report. We're going to jump into a different report. In this case, we'll look at our standard sales report. Now, this is a report that you yourself have. So if you'd like to try this along with me and see, you can take advantage of this. I'll run my search filter so that way I've got a couple of months of sales information. And we can see in this example that I've got one order. And that's about it. And we'll look at the sales report by rep instead. This will show information a bit differently and a bit more close to what your standard product has. So in this case, you see we have our different columns listed and we have our different information pulled within them. If we look at the editor for this, and by no means do I suggest doing this normally, but just for today's example, we can see that the columns in this report are structured so that there's gaps in between some of them, like in this case between the amount and the inside services columns. If we try to push this report out to Excel, we'll see that this report, when we push our data out only, which is how I would suggest doing it, it's going to have an additional column in between those two for the amount and the inside services columns. run our data and then I'll export it. So our example here shows this blank column because of that. And also if we do a column width mass update, we also have these extra columns here created. This is because of how the group header band had the text boxes set up to export the sales rep name because it was a wider text container that spanned across company name, but not quite to job description. It created additional columns for that information. Doing this might mean that you may have column headers that are not quite in line with your column names. And also, you'll notice that we have our little green carrots in the cells that we're looking at here that have numbers referenced within them. Excel will try to convert these to numbers, and that is because these text boxes themselves in the report are designed as text fields rather than numeric fields. I built a report that shows this information a little bit differently. or we can make that adjustment if we need to by making a few changes. In this case, we'll jump into our sales reports list. Sales report by rep for export. In this case, now we can prepare the modifications required to make sure that everything extracts nice and cleanly. So that way it can either be manipulated in Excel or at least looks nicer in Excel. And also looks good while being printed. So what you'd need to do first is make sure that when you're looking at your text containers, when you select one or select multiple, you'll see that there's a text format listed up here, as well as a text format for the property of the column here. These are all listed as general text columns or text containers. And what this translates to is they are just going to show text regardless of what's being loaded in them. This means that for a date, 
for currency or for text strings. They're just any combination of numbers and letters. There is no formatting being applied. It's all standardized. Certain reports will have some code in them that tell the fields how they need to format. For instance, you see this format command that says take this text, format it like a currency with zero decimal places, and then do that to this particular data column. Well, that's fine. We can simply select each individual component, change its formatting to a currency type, and then when it exports out into Excel, it maintains that formatting property. Additionally, I'll line up the text columns here, so that way everything is adjacent and there's no empty gap. Also move over my job description and company name. We'll make the order number and sales rep a little bit closer to the same size. And we'll fill in that space there. So again, there's nothing that would be cut off. And finally, I'll shrink my sales rep column so that way it's the same width as the company. Lastly, we'll take this totals column and we'll expand it so it's the same width as the text box above it for invoice date. And we'll make sure everything else is in line too. You can tell quickly if the columns are of the same size by control clicking them and looking at the width and also the left point of all those columns. If they are different in width, length, et cetera, then you'll see that there will be no value displayed because there is no consistent or equal value for all text containers that are selected. I mean, if you do have multiple selected in the same column that are exactly the same width and in the same point of reference to base that width on, then, well, their left and width values will be equal. With that modification made, because we didn't change a whole lot, we can just click save and exit the report. Now, if we run our new report for that same range, then when we do a save and export, you know, everything looks pretty much the same. What we end up pushing out is more akin to what exactly we want to interact with. In this case, our column headers are nice and evenly lined up. Our numeric fields are classified in such a way that they can be sorted by using the data property sorts within Excel. And if you were to do something to like add a sum to them, it would actually do the math immediately because everything's formatted as it needs to be. Now, in this example, you'll see that we have our service totals as $695 because two even dollar amounts in each column. That is because the number columns that are here push out actual number data. If these were say $500.15, we would get 500.15 to represent that. So everything would still mathematically add up together. You wouldn't see any rounding in those cases. We still have a carrot here on our order number column and that's because one of my two order numbers is not specifically a numeric column or I'm sorry, a numeric data value. So you can modify your order numbers, but you can see that there may be cases that you don't need to do that, at least to your order and estimate numbers. Now you can also put your data out into a CSV file. If we look at our original report, we can go to our save command and instead of selecting Microsoft Excel file, we can go to data file and select CSV, making sure that our separator is a icon or character of choice. And once you push, oops, once you push that out, Then your CSV file will be opened in the program it's defaulted to look at. 
and you'll have everything extract out as it most accurately would. And this will be related to the column length and width, just like we saw with our modification, because this only references data rather than the grouping bands around the data. However, you'll see your column headers may not make sense for what they're referencing. This goes along with the properties of the text box themselves. It happens to be a feature related to what I was describing earlier in the training where we were relabeling our pages. The name of each text box or text column is what's being extracted out. So we'll see in the case for our order number being called data text two. If we select the data cell in the data band and scroll down in our properties list, or just look in our drop-down selector to tell us what we're looking at, you can see that the name is data text two. By changing the name of the text column, we'll say order number, that will result in the export for CSV changing this to what it is that we just typed. You can continue to do so for each individual text field all the way over in this case to the right for text 21. You'll see that our rightmost column is referencing text 21 as well. So changing those up will make sure that your CSV exports will be used correctly. And you probably won't need to worry too much about CSV exports. However, if you utilize Midnight's customer data for a marketing tool like Salesforce or some other mass mailing program, you may need to make sure that your column headers match whatever your program that you're adding that CSV information into is compatible with. Unfortunately, there is uh, very little in terms of consistency for what we can prepare these reports to have integration with because by default, they're just meant to be run out and either emailed or printed as a PDF or just as a general paper document. And also because of the various platforms that integrate the data with Midnight, we can only prepare these to print out in so many ways due to printer drivers changing some default settings on how reports and their objects print out. So we've got these set up as best we can, but you may need to make some modifications to your individual text cells just to make sure everything prints or saves out the way that you'd want it to. Now, the final thing that we'll be looking at for this is the implementation of a sub report. Sub reports are reports within reports, and there's no better report to look at this than one of our work order reports. Work order reports are complicated. They have a lot of different fields of data. They have a lot of different types of data that can be placed onto them. And if you were to look at one of our stock reports, that includes information for say print estimating, inventory, service data, and general customer information. You'll see that on the surface, while everything looks fine, that there may be sub-reports that show your information in a variety of ways to make everything look as good as it does. In this case, we have our customer info and postage info here at the top. We have a block for our print estimating information. We have our general service info. And we carry into the second page, we have the rest of our services and also inventory. The sheer enormity of data that you see in here has to be classified and sorted out in some way. We can see this easily by editing the report and looking at the different sub-reports that the main report is called to look through. So because the formatting of the report work order versions is a little bit different. We see a group header band here at the top with our header information, postage and customer info here at the top as well. And we have data bands, I'm sorry, we have sub reports listed within our one data band that show the different types of info that we're referencing. And as we select each one, you'll see a sub report one is referenced, sub report four is referenced, services, and then inventory are referenced as well. And you'll see up here at the top our pages where we had a different version of the report created in our other report. These are now, well, sub-reports. They're effectively different types of data that appear 
within the report and when called are displayed in their particular requested location. It's a great way, number one, to save on space for the designer because you're not able to really fit dozens and dozens and dozens of these text boxes on top of each other without just running out of room. And two, it lets you group everything out to make sure you don't misunderstand which data elements you're looking at when trying to make modifications to your report down the road. The first subreport that we see it called is subreport number one. In this, or in this example, this is referencing the print estimate portion. This shows the printer information like the uh, press used, the material consumed, the ink combinations, etc. The second is a wide format print operation subreport, and in our example that we looked at, there was nothing there. Our services subreport shows our service information, and our inventory subreport shows our inventory information with barcode and all. So you can see the value of creating these subreports and having their data called rather than trying to have way too much information loaded into a single report at once. You're very rarely going to need these subreports. However, on reports like our work orders, reports that are just a bit more complicated in the data that they pull back, perhaps a job costing report that divides out profitability and expenses by category. Those are the types of reports that you'd see these on. If you want to create new subreports, there is a subreport button. These are here in the components area where you'll see things like your text boxes, your image containers, your shape and line handlers, and then also the subreport. You can draw one out and a new page will be generated based on the width of your subreport. In this case, you'll see subreport five now exists and our subreport is linked to subreport five, which is only this wide because of how large we drew it. If we change the size of this, perhaps say edge to edge on the page within the printer margins, of course, then the dimensions of the subreport will expand to go with it. And you can begin filling out the subreport with information you'd like to show up. So that when this is finally called, then this data will display accordingly. Now with the subreports, it is very easy to build too much information into them. So I wanna make sure that you have everything grouped in such a way. So that way you have your, maybe a group header, group footer and data band listed within each subreport and perhaps one or two header portions to go along with them. In this case, like my services page, I have the group header and footer and data for my service info and the department that they're all within, as well as the comments that exist within each different service type. And then a header to show the service information entirely for the, uh, the column labels. You can build additional logic for more than one subreport by say copying the one that you've seen here and all of its features and adding secondary levels or secondary subreports. Those newly created ones can have different filters. For instance, if you want to show certain services within one department or another department, you can have a duplicate of this services subreport, one that shows all services within say your data department by adding a filter to tell it to look at my service type code or service type name of data. And then creating another subreport or copying everything into another subreport and then setting that one up so it looks for all services that are not in data and also have a quantity greater than zero. You can see the value in this because there may be certain types of information that you want to show and certain types that you don't. And this allows you to set up the variety. So that way, if you're showing all of your, say, mailing information, uh, customer rebate information and, and a variety of other pieces, but you don't want to show everything as far as maybe printed info, cutting, that sort of thing, uh, you can set your report to just look at that and then have each different sub report only show what it is that you're looking for. 
You may find yourself doing it on invoices as well, or maybe you want to customize an invoice to not show any of your $0 services, or there's specific services that you don't want to show, but you want to sum together. Uh, there's a variety of ways to use it, so definitely use that at your whim. Because I modified our standard report here, I'm not going to save it. However, I am going to go back into reports for one more thing. This finisher will look at our sales report by rep that we just created a few minutes ago for export. This report itself may not be set to the dimensions of the stock that we want to print on. Notably, you have reports that are going to need to be set to eight and a half by 11 with a quarter inch margin or perhaps something a little bit larger. Some of our reports were built in such a way that they were utilized for clients in different nations and therefore use different paper sizes like A4. The simplest way to update the dimensions of your page itself are to either click a blank area of the page and manually type in your dimensions and doing the same with your margins, noting that they appear in order from left with a semicolon to separate, to right, to top, to bottom. Or you can click the page label here at the top and actually select your page size, 8.5 by 14, 8.5 by 11, change your margins to very narrow 0.2 inches or standard 0.4 inches, and also your orientation from portrait to landscape. You can switch on the button click. Doing this will, of course, change up your dimensions of your page. One, to standardize it on the stock you're printing it with. And two, it will give you more room visually to place on the different elements of data that you want to display. If you're doing a report where everything is tightly pressed up against each other, then you may need to be a bit more creative in how you get everything to lay itself out. For this example, I'm going to get rid of these lines and add a border to each component allowing me to select all the text boxes within and moving them accordingly without selecting and moving the lines. But the point of this is to take note that from left to right, certain text boxes may have text that's almost on top of each other. An example would be if we have our invoice date over here next to the job description and the company name. But in this case, if we were to have the invoice date right aligned and the company name left aligned, you can see how close they are. If we run a preview, we'll really see how close they are. You can see how there's barely a gap between them. If you need more of a gap, you can do so by making sure that the margins or padding within each different text component are split out accordingly. The way to do this is to select your text container, and I would always suggest doing this to all of them. And taking this margins property of the text additionals, and setting so up just a two-point margin for left, right, top, and bottom. What this does is it moves the text within its text box more inward, so that way it's not next to or right up adjacent to the edge of its own component. That way, if we change up what our data is and we need to have it pulled out in a printable format, you can see there's much more of a gap to make it more legible. This is something that you may also need to consider when handling printing, because when you do print reports, Chrome will often do things like try to shrink it down or scale it down to fit within the properties of your printer. And that's just a standard setting that you may see when trying to do a file print of a document out of midnight or any website, really. Something else that we see occasionally as a problem is that the text blocks themselves will not expand to fit the amount of text that's within them. 
An example of this would be if the job description or project name were to be an extremely long one and wrap down two lines. If the boxes are not set to grow in such a way that your printer driver or the printer that's connected to your machine is set to do automatically, then it simply may not do it. And you have to forcibly tell the report's text boxes to do that for you. In this case, I'm going to select all of my text boxes here. Well, everything really. And if and apply the features that way if they were to grow in some way. That number one, they have their word wrapping set to true, therefore carrying the text that would continue down to a second line. And also set the can grow property to true, so that way the box will grow vertically to accommodate for the text that's being presented down on the second line. A simple way to see this would be with this job description column. If we shrink it down too much, you can see that our text is only fitting on one line. What you can't see is that with the can grow, when the report is actually rendered, it will grow vertically to account for the height of the text that's caused by the creation of this second line. For things like a column header label, you won't see this happening very frequently because you'll normally build them so that way they have enough room to display. But for data like a project name, a contact name, a service name, those might carry forth more space. And a even larger offender of this is an invoice comment or a work order comment, which can sometimes include paragraphs of text. You always need to make sure those are set so that way if they attempt to be printed as a PDF or printed to your printer, that they can account for the fact that they have to expand in order to show everything. Make sure that's the property set to your boxes and, and mass. Again, the can grow and word wrapping, and you'll be good to go whenever you try to print, email a PDF or either or. This concludes everything for today's midnight training on advanced level report editing. There is, of course, a lot more to consider when it comes to editing reports, such as how to get data onto your reports, how to manipulate it even further, say grabbing the first couple of characters from a text value, um, rounding your decimal values to a certain place, et cetera. Those I can handle and assist you with as they come in, as they tend not to be too frequently asked. For those cases, email it to us at support at printreach.com any outstanding questions that you have, be it report customization, feature add-ins, et cetera, and we'll do our best to assist. Additionally, if you see a report that does not have data on it and you've looked through the dictionary and don't see a data column labeled for what it is that you're looking for, if you want to add a search filter or modify how they behave, such as defaulting the date ranges to different date ranges or adding an additional search option like sales for customer by sales rep. You will have to let us know that as those are fields that we control. Through security, we can't open them up too much and therefore they're pretty much locked down entirely, but we can build customizations on the back end and depending on the report needs and complexity, if there's a cost involved, we'll let you know and we'll help get your report built as effectively and quickly as we can. With all that said, thank you for attending today's reports training. Do check the comments of this video as I do have in there a link to our Stimulsoft reports editing guide. It is much more detailed than the training I went over today and shows you more of the ins and outs of how to modify your text, how to change how it behaves, etc. And between this training and that report's guide, hopefully most of your questions will be answered. Have a swell day and we'll see you next time.